Well, we hear a lot about a cost of living crisis uh, in this country, and uh, certainly its economic situation is, is grim. But it's uh, nothing compared with what things were like in Samaria, where we read that uh, a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels, which, uh, which was a lot of money, or the wonderfully phrased a fifth of a cab of dove stone <laughs> for five shekels. I think it's translated differently in some other versions. <laughs> but uh, Basically, the last dregs of anything that could be eaten were being consumed. And they were in this desperate, desperate situation where they were resorting to cannibalism. And uh, it's worth re remembering, of course, that that situation had been brought about by their, their sin, uh, by their constant disobedience to God and their idolatry. And uh, God has raised up Ben Haddad as amongst others, as according to the word of Elijah, as a judgment against them, uh, to bring them back to himself. Uh, king G None of the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel were, were good. None of them were great reformers. Uh, but Jehoram was one of the better ones. But uh, he was... Uh, still being very much involved in the idolatry uh, and never hadn't got his repented of it or turned from his land but we do note through this passage uh, that at the end of chapter 6 certain things one that under his royal robes he is wearing sackcloth he's actually in a state of repentance he may be covering that repentance up but he is still acknowledging that he also acknowledges that it's a judgment from the Lord. Uh, in the warped way of uh, <coughs> such uh, the fallen mind, of course, he lashes out at uh, Elisha and blames it on him uh, because he's the, uh, the, the one that brings the word of God to them, that proclaims the truth. Uh, and he lashes out against him and says he's going to behead him. Uh, but actually, he still goes to Elijah to seek out the word, a word from the Lord. He recognises his situation, uh, that it is only the Lord that can save them. So we do have as, uh, a situation that of somebody that's coming to almost, I would say, a point of salvation. They have a, uh, there is repentance. There is a seeking after the word of the Lord. There is acknowledgement that uh, their situation is actually brought about by their sin. And uh, so we have those sort of things uh, as, as an introduction to, to the, the wonderful grace that's uh, shown in chapter 7, where we see very much that just a touch from the Lord completely transforms the situation. But the starting point of this, the starting point of salvation, the starting point of deliverance is that of a, one of repentance, but it is seeking out and heeding the word of the Lord, which we've got at the beginning of the chapter, beginning of chapter 7. The king has sought out the word. That word has been given. It's a word of grace. And uh, a call to heed that word. And of course, we have this little twist in the story. There's the unbeliever. The person that scorns the word of God. And we, uh, we see as we come to the end of the story, the result of that. So point number one. Seek and heed the word of the Lord, the prophetic word. Second issue is this. We see the men that God uses uh, as his heralds, as his agents, to deliver the word, to deliver the good news, are really unlikely candidates. They're people completely on the fringes of, a, of society. They were lepers, they were people that were kept at a distance. And uh, 
Just a reminder, there was a, a quote, uh, I, all, I think attributed to the primitive Methodists, that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to beg bread. And that's beautifully illustrated here. These are desperate men. Men with no, no um, hope in their own resources of accomplishing anything, of accomplishing their dis deliverance, who go to a desperate group of people who also, whose resources have all failed, who cannot solve their own situation with the good news. That's evangelism. And it's uh, good to be reminded of the basicness of that in a... Uh, that salvation, deliverance, is completely from the Lord. As we've already acknowledged in our, tonight in our prayers and that, we cannot change anybody's heart. We can proclaim the word, we can pray, and God in his mercy uses these things. But the Holy Spirit has to work in people's hearts to, to bring to them to a knowledge of the truth. The Holy, God had to work in this situation to deal with the Syrian army. The people of Samaria were completely incapable of doing that. But God could use as his messengers, as his agents, the most unlikely of people, the people that were completely on the fringes of, of that city and of society. Any, all of us it can be witnesses to the truth. We can be used by God. And I say, in the bizarre world of church culture, and we've, uh, we've seen a lot this week of grandiose buildings, uh, and our people who will wear funny clothes and uh, have great platforms. That is not what God needs to be for an evangelist, for someone who proclaims his word. All he needs is a beggar that's found salvation and recognises the value of what he has and goes and shares it with other people that need it. So, point number two, God can use anybody and he uses un unlikely people very often. I'd like to pick up for point number three on just a word, uh, come let us surrender to the army of the, the Syrians. Well, I don't suggest that ever in any context we surrender to the enemy, but the word surrender, to surrender to the Lord, is quite a key word. It's for many, you hear this a lot in testament, testimonies, I'm sure it's been true in all our own experience, a different situation. It is moments of complete desperation when we wait upon the Lord and we effectively surrender and commit everything to him at the moment when his, he moves and his grace is given. It's be, the hymn, All to Thee I Surrender, has become one of the, uh, the great dedication hymns for me. I think that's a very key thing. This uh, holding on to things that, or beliefs that somehow we can do things in our own strength, our own power, or simply that we will not acknowledge our complete and wholehearted need of the Lord. And point number three, the need to surrender to the Lord. And number four, the word twilight. They arose at twilight. Darkness was falling, but there was still enough light to see. Obviously, for them, it was a, there was enough. They thought it was perhaps a good time, a safe time. But darkness is falling in this land. We've, we've acknowledged that it's a time of change, uh, and that's very much been uh, hastened by the recent events. But there is moral confusion. A country that's completely lost the word and completely lost direction has this moral confusion uh, but beyond and within that all sorts of evil is creeping in the demonic is getting a hold but we look at the international level we see the men of violence the, the Putins 
and uh, the way that they destroy the lives of so many and uh, basically unsettle the whole world. Evil men bringing darkness. We also see the power of uh, probably uh, big corporations, the Microsoft, the Googles, and their desire to, uh, well, I might use the word exploit, but to control uh, really as many people as they can for their own purposes. Darkness is falling, but it's still a day of grace. It's still a day of good news. As we've acknowledged tonight, we still have the privilege of being able to proclaim the gospel freely. We still have the privilege of worshipping freely. We still have the, as we've thought about, a country that gives it so much freedom and uh, is uh, still democratic and uh, to a certain extent. And uh, we live in beautiful surroundings and so much grace falls upon us. It's still a day of grace, but the darkness is falling. It's twilight. They find the unexpected. How many times do we go into different situations where you perhaps... uh, say well that person will never change and things like that but you go into certain situations and they're completely different because God has moved we uh, have that Charles Wesley's hymn give me that faith that longs to sink the mountain to a plain that childlike praying love that longs to build thy house again Very often what we expect is so limited. So limited. Did these pit leprous men... Fair enough to them, they hadn't even heard the prophetic word. Uh, But in their own wisdom, they had no real... A very limited expectation of deliverance. And what they found was way beyond what they expected. So the the grace of God so often goes so way, way beyond what we would expect. And uh, perhaps just to be reminded of the the key thing here, that it was just a touch from the Lord that transformed that situation. That's all it takes. To us, it's the impossible. To the Lord, it's, <laughs> it's nothing. And, uh, you know, in the, in the ministry, of the earthly ministry of Jesus, you just see things like where he touched the leper. He actually touched the leper. He didn't uh, uh, touch, uh, which was effectively touching the untouchable. And the, the leper was healed. Uh, the wonder of just a touch from the Lord that transformed the situation, transformed that leper's life. Uh, not just healed him, but that someone was, uh, had the grace to actually come and do that to touch him. The wonder of a touch from the Lord, and so often it's beyond our expectations. Well, these men did what <laughs> uh, you would perhaps expect them to do. They just re- reveled in, in the wonder of the, the opportunity that was theirs. For their, this abundance of food, this abundance of wealth, that they just tried to hoard it up from themselves, which is the, a natural reaction. And then the, uh, the truth, the realisation hits them. In the key verse in this passage, This is a day of good news, and we keep silent. This is for everybody, it's not just for us. Uh, So that's good to be reminded of that. I think there are, (laughs) you can go down that road where the wonder and the riches of God's word are, uh, you you, uh, become dominant, you just seek it and you, you seek more of it and you hoard up more of it. 
and uh, you don't share it with the world outside. Uh, you can go down that road. These people uh, recognised, these lepers, that this, we remain silent with this wonderful news. So they take it to the city. Uh, they are met with scepticism, as you so often are. And there is a need um, in evangelism for per persuasion and for you know, things like apologetics. They have their place. And a uh, key thing is perhaps this servant. And he said, well, uh, go and see. Um, you know, just uh, go out and look. Don't just dismiss these men's news. And the king eventually sends men out and say, go and see. And that's the sense that is always true. The truth is there. The wonder of what God's grace is there. The wonder of salvation is there. And we can testify it. A world outside may not be able to see it because they're blinded uh, to the truth. And unless God removes that blindness, they will not see it. But um, persuasion uh, uh, is something that God sometimes uses and sometimes is necessary. And that's uh, used here. There is a sense of a... There's a little bit of pressure put on to persuade the king to send people out and to, to go and see. Well, we see as a... Always, the prophetic word proves itself true. Exactly as was proclaimed is exactly what happened. Good to be reminded of that. People thought that word was impossible and yet within 24 hours it was a, a reality. The word will prove itself true. And finally, salvation is for those who believe. Justification is by faith. The unbeliever in this story does not take part, uh, it does not have the privilege of receiving the blessings of grace as according to the word of the Lord. Uh, judgment has found, fallen upon him because of his unbelief. And he receives, does not receive, the uh, salvation, that's a uh, provision that's been brought. So some helpful uh, points towards uh, perhaps just mission from a different angle. Starting point after repentance is uh, seek out the prophetic word. Remember, God uses unusual people, and in fact can use any people, uh, to be agents. His agents, his heralds, just to share the wonder of salvation. Do recognise the need to surrender to the Lord. It was a point of desperation these men went out. I so said, often it's perhaps... As it says something to us, it's desperation that brings us to the Lord. It's sometimes desperation that forces us to move on and to move out in the Lord's purposes. They went to the camp of the enemy and uh, they went at twilight. Darkness was falling. They found the unexpected. Just a move from the touch from the Lord transformed the situation. They reveled in the abundance of the grace they found, but then they recognised the need to share that. Today is a day of good news, and we remain silent. They were met with scepticism, but eventually the king responded to their news. And that salvation was shared with everybody. The word proved itself true, exactly true but it was for those who believed.